Aloha kakou. My name is Roy Gao. I'm an astronomer at the University of Hawaii's Institute for Astronomy, and I'll be tonight's moderator. So once uh, you have questions, which we'll save to the very end, we'll, which we'll do after each speaker's section, um, you can ask them in the chat or the Q&A, and I will pass them along as I can to the speakers. So today we have a double header. First, we have Doug Simons, the newly minted director of the Institute for Astronomy. He began only on September 1st. who will be telling about, us about his vision for the Institute for Astronomy. And following that, David Sanders, one of our astronomers at the Institute, will be talking about an upcoming large program with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due to launch in December, called the Cosmos Webb Survey. And as I said, I'm your moderator. I just want to point out that you can keep up with news from the Institute for Astronomy on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And you can also check out our website. And uh, the link is here. And I'm saying that because we will be posting a news story tomorrow morning with some cool new science. So a little bit about our first speaker, Doug Simons. He got his Bachelor's of Science in Caltech. That's also where I got my PhD. And then he came to the Institute for Astronomy where he got his PhD in 1990. And he's been here uh, ever since as a big part of the astronomy community. He joins the Canada-France Wise Telescope on Hawaii Island as a staff astronomer, and then moved over to Gemini Observatory uh, where he went from system scientist to an associate director for development all the way to director. And then he moved back to CFHT and then continuing his slide back to the Institute for Astronomy, he is back with us now as a director of the IFA. And he's deeply involved in the Hawaii community. Um, he's the president-elect of the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce. He's on the board of the Kona Kahala Chamber of Commerce. And he's helped develop many uh, programs, bringing together the broader community and astronomy uh, and observatories on Hawaii Island. But he's also a multi-talented person. Um, Here's a picture of his family out hunting with their uh, retrievers. Uh, where they, he does bird hunting on Hawaii Island. And he's also an extremely talented work, woodworker. Here's an inlaid table he made for the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. I'm hoping he'll make one for the IFA as well. And I'll introduce our second speaker now um, as well. And that's David Sanders. He's an astronomer at the IFA. He got his PhD at State University of New York in Stony Brook. And he's advised over a dozen PhD students. So he has a very large academic uh, lineage. He's an expert on ULERGs. Astronomers love acronyms. That stands for ultra luminous infrared galaxies. They're a very interesting kind of galaxy. And I think we'll hear more about them in his talk. And he's worked on many large scale programs to try to understand how galaxies like our own Milky Way and others in the universe evolve over time, especially those that host uh, active black holes or have a lot of ongoing star formation. I like to show this chart because it succinctly shows um, the Mauna Kea Observatory is combined with respect to co-located telescopes around the world. And this is a trend that occurs every year. It's, it's a chart that shows what we call science impact, which is a product of the total number of papers multiplied by their citations. So it's a kind of a gauge of quantity times quality. And um, uh, MKOs year after year are number one in this ranking. And, and the people of Hawaii um, uh, should, should be really, really proud of that because this is a reflection of the commitment, the interest, the dedication of everybody in Hawaii to make this leadership role, um, this really preeminence in, in this field of science possible. Uh, what really makes it possible though is Mount Akea. We, we kind of have an unfair advantage with the competition given the site qualities that we have on the mountain. So by the numbers, um, Hawaii astronomy leads to roughly 14, 1500 jobs across the state, mostly on Oahu and Hawaii Island. Uh, if you added up all the operations costs over the past 50 years or so, it's easily north of $2 billion that's been invested in the economy. Most of that goes into the economy through the paychecks of the 500 plus uh, people that work at the observatories and the, the extra two to 300 people that work at the IFA. Um, as I showed in that previous slide, higher scientific, scientific impact of, uh, compared to any other co-located observatory complex in the world at least 10,000 people per year participate in our outreach programs. It's, it's probably several times that when you really add that up over the course of a year. Workforce pipeline, et cetera. So, so over those past 50 years, we really have put together a pretty amazing uh, uh, collective effort uh, here in Hawaii with our astronomy program. So with that as background, we'll focus a bit more on the IFA itself. Uh, this is a, a Mamani seed and a seed pod taken up at uh, uh, Mauna Kea I'm particularly fond of. 
So the IFA actually consists of three facilities, one in uh, Manoa, uh, one on Maui, and one here in Hilo. Uh, all fairly large um, facilities with lots of office space, uh, laboratories, shops. Um, teaching occurs at all three. Most of it's at IFA in Manoa uh, uh, with a uh, fair amount, um, uh, mostly at the graduate level at IFA Hilo. And of course, we are uh, either own or operate um, research facilities on Mauna Kea and Haleakala as well. I think four or five telescopes on Mauna Kea and several on uh, Haleakala. So when you add it up, um, the, the Institute for Astronomy is easily one of the largest university astronomy programs uh, in the world. And um, again, that's a reflection of well, the people of Hawaii, the commitment that we've had from the state, all the international um, investment that's that's been uh, you know, driven by this opportunity to perform state-of-the-art research from the summit of Mauna Kea. So reasons I decided to, to go for it and go back to my alma mater um, and um, have on this, this leadership role as director is first of all personal uh, in the sense that I, I, I got an incredibly good education at the IFA. And uh, you know, looking back at how many things that that led to um, in my career, um, because of the unique nature of being able to work on Mount Akea, the hands-on experience that I got, it was just a really incredible education. And it really drove my, my desire to give back and, and pay it forward to the next generation. So I have a keen interest in helping out our, our students uh, to, to make sure they've got the same shot that I got leaving the IFA. It's also a concern out to make sure that the, the IFA is in good shape. We've got, I think everybody knows, some, some serious challenges ahead uh, given various agreements that have to be worked through and, and issues about TMT, et cetera. And I felt very strongly that I would like to, to do all I can to make sure that the IFA comes through that in strong shape and, and also in a strategic sense. And, and this is the, the last decade or so of my career and I wanna use that time uh, to, to make sure that we end in a good place uh, with uh, Hawaii astronomy over the course of this decade where a lot will be decided. So my initial priorities as director include um, these three pillars, education, research, and kind of my sweet spot, which is instrumentation and technology development. Uh, I spend, I'm only on the job about six weeks, and if I were to add it up, I'd say about a third of my time right now is going into master lease renewal. It's a big job, lots of parts in motion, but it's super important for obvious reasons. And then deepening our community engagement, uh, as, as Roy said, I've lived over half my life uh, in Hawaii, most of it on Hawaii Island. So I'm, I'm um, you know, deeply committed to my community. This is my home and uh, connecting astronomy with the broader community is, is actually one of the funnest parts of my job. So let me tell a little bit about the education program at the IFA. Uh, on the right is an alphabetical list of all the students that have graduated. Don't try and read it, just admire the, the sheer numbers. My name is in there somewhere, I assume. We've had over 200 graduate students uh, educated at the IFA over the past 50 years or so. I know many of them, uh, particularly those from, from the 80s when I was there as a student and, and they have leadership roles in NASA, the National Science Foundation, universities all over the world, laboratories, et cetera. So I'm really proud to be part of that, that grand cohort of IFA graduates that have taken what they learned at the IFA and gone, gone on with some pretty uh, amazing careers uh, scattered all over the world. Um, if you're wondering, our base budget is about $10 million, and we uh, collectively bring in about $20 million of extramural uh, funding. So it's a pretty good return on investment. For every dollar of your taxpayer money, uh, the IFA generates $2 of of uh, extramural funding that uh, gets most, for the most part, pumped back into the economy here. The education program uh, spans actually um, uh, two islands. Uh, UH Hilo has an uh, astronomy program as well. In, in Manoa, um, we have bachelor's of arts and science, bachelor of science programs in astronomy and astrophysics, and of course, the graduate program itself. And uh, these are pictures of, of graduate students uh, taken not long ago, scattered everywhere including the far left, I, I'm, I'm not sure what um, Mice is doing. She looks like he's tucked deep into the, the bowels of a telescope, but she had the shock of science, so I like the picture, I thought I'd show him that. IFA research is all over the place and easily world-class uh, by any stretch of the, the imagination. So I thought I'd share that in the limited time I have. The, as they say, ripping it from the headlines, these are UH News headlines to give you some, some samplers of what's been done uh, recently, including research uh, on exoplanets, um, asteroid research in all its forms uh, is done uh, at the IFA, um, including a particular uh, important area, what we call planetary defense. And that is a, a program run um, principally out of, uh, through PanSTARS, but we also have Atlas on Haleakala and Mauna Loa. 
and there's a lot of synergy between the asteroids, so-called near-Earth objects detected on pan stars and followed up um, on the, by the Mount Kea observatories to determine their orbits with sufficient precision to know if they represent a, a risk to the Earth or not. So, so these days, believe it or not, most near-Earth objects are discovered um, by pan stars, UH uh, IFA facilities on Haleakala compared to any other telescopes in the world. Solar system research has always been a hot, top, a hot topic in um, IFA research, including this object called Far, Far Out, which is um, currently the, the record holder in terms of most distant object uh, in our solar system. Moving out from our solar system, you see here UH to lead NASA Space Telescope study on nature of dying stars, so stellar remnants, a more recent headline uh, pertaining to pulsating stars, uh, red giants that are uh, being observed in great numbers actually is sort of a, an offshoot of uh, uh, exoplanet research. And then going beyond our Milky Way, uh, some of the incredible research that Brent Tully and his team around the world with Juanita Kea and stretching beyond that as well. So basically from our backyard in the solar system to the edge of the visual, visible, visible universe, um, IFA astronomy has uh, made incredible inroads uh, all over the world. Switching gears, one of those other pillars that I mentioned before, IFA technology development. Uh, I'm a hands-on guy. I'm actually more of an instrumentalist than a research scientist. So this is uh, something near and dear to me. One of the neat projects going on right now, actually uh, IFA Hilo, is what's called RoboAO. So that's a robotic telescope combined with the laser guide star and adaptive optic system to improve uh, the clarity, if you will, of images recorded. Uh, Christoph Baranak is the PI of that. He uh, developed the first so-called RoboAO uh, that I believe you see here at the Palomar. And he joined us about five years or so ago and he's building an upgraded version for the UH 2.2 meter. And on the top right, you see Mark Chun who works with me and IFA Hilo with students testing some of the new control software that, that's being used to um, automate and remotely operate uh, uh, the UH 2.2 meter. IFA has a long history in generating very, very large uh, cameras, digital focal planes, if you will. Uh, this is a, a friend and a, a dear friend to many of us, Jerry Lapino, who passed away uh, five, maybe five or six years or so ago with uh, what's called CFHT 12K uh, back then, which is a huge breakthrough uh, and the ability to butt uh, together in close proximity. CCDs to make large digital cameras uh, was a real breakthrough. This, that, that particular camera had 100 million pixels and it was in a sense a prototype for the 1.4 billion pixel detectors that are in place at PanStars 1 and PanStars 2, and that's John Tonry there. I'm sure there's a big smile under that N95 mask. This was well before COVID, so it was there for other reasons on his face. And um, that in turn led to the uh, development of the PanStars facilities on Maui, and um, ultimately the one of the largest astronomy databases ever created that currently is at about two petabytes in a big archive on the mainland from which hundreds of research papers have been uh, generated. It's a gold mine that will be tapped for, for a long, long time uh, through, through various uh, research interests um, by astronomers worldwide. Um, what's closer to what I worked on as a grad student is capturing this picture. So Klaus Hodap stopped by my office a couple of days ago um, and asked, would you like to see something in the lab? Because they're going to take a picture of it. And this for me is, is an amazing uh, collection of infrared sensors, basically priceless, um, literally in terms of cost and also in terms of sort of sentimental value to me. And they've been laid out kind of in a loop here. So this first detector back in 1985, and they go all the way around to larger detectors with greater sensitivity to the, the ones that are being developed right now at, at the IFA. Um, and this is, a, the IFA has a long history of developing infrared arrays. Uh, that first detector back in 1985, I actually remember it was just being tested when I arrived there. I remember booting the computers off of a 10 inch floppy drive. Some of you will know what I'm talking about with the home any electronics as a Honeywell uh, 8x8, all the way up to what are now called Teledyne uh, Y4RG detectors. This is one of the first of them developed. So that's what 16 million pixels um, uh, that can uh, capture um, uh, wide field images of the sky with exquisite sensitivity. Those sensors aren't just used at the IFA, they're used all over the world. And this is something important to keep in mind that the technology development at the IFA leverages astronomy research through instrumentation globally. Uh, this is the very first example of it. They're looking at a time-lapse video of the integration of an instrument called Spiru at CFHT a few years ago. And that was the first use of a Hawaii 4RG or an H4RG detector um, uh, as a, a sensor in a, a facility class instrument. It's what's called a 
a spectral polarimeter, and it's being uh, used now in one of the largest exoplanet surveys ever conducted for Mauna Kea. This is something Dave's going to talk about, so I'll, I won't steal his thunder, but uh, that same technology has been deployed in the James Webb Space Telescope. That is, uh, to my knowledge, the most expensive satellite ever launched. Fingers crossed everything will go fine uh, later on this year when that is launched. So I just want to give you a sense of the, the depth and breadth of technology impact that is occurring uh, here in Hawaii through this type of activity and how it touches uh, essentially all corners of astronomy on the ground and in space. So uh, Hubble Space Telescope set the, set the wheels moving up here in the left, but over the next 15 years, the Cosmos team has managed to win the largest allocation in total of telescope time in the world for any one study. We have the largest allocation ever for Spitzer time, which is an infrared telescope, which is now passed on. Um, same with the Herschel telescope. We were one of the largest programs there. Um, it's in the far infrared where dust emits. That telescope is now passed on. Uh, we say pass on when they run out of coolant or and then they're turned off. Uh, one of the larger allocations of time for GALAX, a UV telescope. Um, and then the two X-ray telescopes that are still flying, Newton and Chandra, we also have uh, some of the largest allocations of time on those telescopes. On the ground, the VLA, um, we have certainly the largest allocation there for radio studies. Um, on Mauna Kea, we have Subaru, which played a major role in imaging the entire cosmos field in many bands. And that was another way of getting a spectrum of, a, of every galaxy in the, in the cosmos field. And that allowed us to determine their, their distance. This is the Keck telescope where we actually took real spectra. Um, and then finally, the Atacama array, which is in Chile at an elevation even higher than Mauna Kea. Um, and, uh, we haven't, we, we've had a number of programs on, on uh, ALMA. Okay. So this is just partly from our Cosmos website. If you were to go there, if you're really interested in Cosmos, go to the Cosmos, just type in Cosmos Astronomy. It takes you right to the website. Uh, this tells you something about uh, being able to determine distances to galaxies. You're looking at how things looked, you know, when they were only, you know, one tenth of their current age. So 12 billion years, this is sort of, it should be 13 or 13 and a half where we are today. Galaxies look sort of ordered uh, to those of us who study galaxies. If you find galaxies uh, further away, you can translate their redshift, it's so-called redshift is to billions of years in the past. Um, galaxies become bluer and more chaotic. They are made of many pieces that are merging to come together. The blueness is because they're forming a lot of their stars. Our sun was formed four and a half billion years ago. So it was somewhere around the, um, well, 8.4 uh, line here. Here's an example of uh, just on the website of a galaxy looking at what it might have looked like um, at during different phases of its life from a blue system forming a lot of stars to a more red and dead system later on. So Cosmos is writing the book on galaxy evolution and when stars formed, how many formed, et cetera, as well as black holes. That's a blow up in case you couldn't see everything in detail in that previous image. But as you go back in time, things become really disordered and, and weirdish. Um, and that's what our galaxy went through. So the real meat of the story, uh, this story, is that about the time that Hubble was launched, there was a study committee to make the next generation telescope. Once you have one, you got to be ready for the next. And so uh, Doug may know, uh, there's people in Pasadena actually led, Alan Dressler led the team that wrote the book of, to propose the next generation space telescope. Around 1988, it was selected by the Decadal Review and, and it was going to only cost, I know I'm gonna make an analogy with Honolulu Braille, but uh, it only cost half a billion dollars. That was the idea back then. 
And in the end, it's ended up costing nearly $10 billion. Part of that is just inflation. Another part is it was a lot harder than expected. Um, but the Hubble primary mirror is only two meters and the JW, it's a mosaic like the Keck telescope. Uh, it's also gold plated uh, for a reason. And it has about 10 times the collecting area. It's also too big to fit in the fairing of a launch vehicle. So it has to be folded up, which is another thing to, to worry about. The gold plating is because the James Webb Next Generation Space Telescope um, is designed to, to observe out into the infrared. And infrared gets messy if you have heat sources around. Uh, it also has a different reflectance uh, than silver. And so gold was decided to be the best uh, thing. It didn't cost all that much. You just vaporize some gold and there you have it. Um, I should say that around the year 2000, this is what every mission goes through. There was a serious worry about cost overruns. And so like any mission that isn't completed exactly on time, it has to go through a thorough re-review. And so the Space Board commissioned a review of the James, it wasn't called the James Webb then, the Next Generation Space Telescope. And there was serious consideration to chopping off its infrared capability beyond five microns, say. Um, it was already destined to start using Hawaii arrays. I don't know whether they were fully developed by that time, but, but there was a, a suggestion to stop it at, at the shorter wavelength. Um, but it was because it was realized that studies that I and others have been doing in the infrared showing that galaxies really look different. And actually when they're making most of their stars and such, they're doing it inside a dust cocoon. And so to learn about them, you have to have the infrared and the far infrared. Um, and, and that scientific argument was so overwhelming that they decided to keep the full capability for the telescope. And uh, that's what we're launching uh, this year. So with that, here's a picture of Webb assembled. I actually went to see it. Um, it was both housed at Goddard in a clean room and the same type of clean room when it moved to Northrop Grumman on the West Coast. And I believe this is a picture at, at Grumman. Uh, I should note the Hawaii connections continue. Um, Although John Mather, the chief scientist of James Webb, he's also a Nobel laureate. He got the prize in 2006 for his discovery of the temperature of the microwave background with another satellite called COBE. But the deputy project scientist, as somebody that uh, Doug must know well, um, Jonathan Gardner, is the deputy chief scientist of JWST. I didn't know he's also the head of the Laboratory for Cos Observational Cosmology at the Goddard Space Flight Center. He got his PhD in Hawaii in 2005. Um, so we get all of our news, official news notes, the real official note of what's going on with JW comes from Jonathan Gardner. So he's a good person to know. And what we're after is that galaxies are not distributed randomly in the universe. That's why you need a field as large as the cosmos field. You can't be as small as the Hubble Deep Field. And that's why they actually gave Nick the original time you know, 18 years ago is to observe a region because the original Hubble Deep Field could have been looking at where my cursor is, a very small blank area or a very rich area um, of the cosmos because the cosmos is sort of in a web-like structure, which is where we get our cosmos web name. This has been featured on the covers of magazines. Galaxies are not distributed randomly in the universe. The reason is because there's dark energy, dark matter that's pushing things around and that's a big area of research. Uh, I thought I would show you very quickly, I'm almost at the end of my talk, a, a little mosaic of how structure evolves. It's very simple, but you can find these things on the web. Um, that's how the cosmic web is generated from a very early pea soup of epic reionization, everything distributed normally to something like this. So gravity is at play bringing things together, but something else is pushing things, making big voids. That's what dark energy is. Well, let's see if I can go beyond. So now we, what are we looking forward to? Well, just a month ago or so, James Webb was folded up from its configuration here. It was loaded aboard a rocket, 
uh, well, it was folded up so it could be loaded aboard a rocket to be launched. Um, it was loaded onto a transport ship and just a few weeks ago, it arrived in French Guiana. It's in the car uh, cargo hold of this uh, uh, ship. Um, what's going to happen? It's going to be launched uh, from French Guiana on an Ariane rocket, a European rocket. Um, it will be fully deployed shortly after launch, and then it will take 14 days and a million miles to get to something called L2. This sounds like a science fiction data point, but L2 is actually one of the five Lagrangian points. Anyway, read up about it, uh, but it's on the back, it's on the far side of the earth um, from the sun and it stays there. So it orbits like the earth does around the sun. The moon does its own thing. Um, anyway, that's a pretty neat deal. Um, if you look at the James Webb telescope when it's fully deployed, these are all of its parts. Um, it has a five stage sun shield and that's for keeping the sun away. And also it's five stages in order to, that if an asteroid hits through, it'll not give a direct hole for sunlight to come in. It'll probably come in at an angle. So direct sunlight won't be able to navigate all five panels. Anyway, it's a complex instrument. It's interesting to note that on the sunshine, you could actually on the sun side of the sunshade, you could actually cook eggs. Um, on the dark side or the cool side, uh, you'd freeze. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's lower than the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So it's a, it's a unique facility. Um, that's a summary of what's going on. And I thought I would leave you with a uh, slide that says, watch the launch, December 18th, 7.20 a.m. Eastern time. And I, of course, you will immediately do what I do. You'll forget daylight savings time. Uh, so it's only five hours from the East Coast, which means you only have to get up at 2.20 a.m. in the morning and you can watch the launch. Uh, it will arrive at L2 just about January 1, 2022. So we look forward to a great next year. Thank you.